I'm Mahibaksha from Hiroshima. But the past 50 years or so, I have been living in Canada. I am retired now uh, from the profession of social work. But actually, I devoted most of my adult life for disarmament, education, and advocacy. I'm here in New York because something very important is happening at the United Nations. A nuclear non-proliferation review, hmm? non nuclear non-proliferation treaty review conference which means every five years is meeting at the United Nations. Have you read anything about this in the paper? No? Just a few hands. I see. Wow. That's sad. Such an important event, but, and which is happening right here. But anyway, uh, many governmental delegates, as well as non-governmental organization sent the delegates, and they are all talking together at the United Nations. Uh, fortunately, they gave me a few minutes to talk, so I would like to speak out um, something important on behalf of all the survivors, but on behalf of all of the human family. I just want to say, get, let's get rid of all the nuclear weapons and do a good job, get rid of them as quickly as possible. That would be my message. And that's what I want to talk with you about this afternoon. Let's show why. I will share my personal experience to start with. Um, I was a 13-year-old schoolgirl, but during the wartime, we hardly had the academic work in the classroom. We were mobilized to do the work for the farmers and the city office and military forces. I had been chosen to be a member of a um, student group to act, to be trained and to act as a decoding assistant, decoding the top secret messages coming from the front. Imagine 13 year old girl doing that kind of important job, you know, and three American battleships are heading up north towards Japan from the south and things like that. That meant Japan was losing the war and all the able-bodied young people were out there fighting and we girls and the boys in middle school and senior schools were mobilized to do the work. Well, on that day, I was at the headquarter, uh, one mile away from uh, um, Hypo Center. Um, you have another word for that, uh, I can't remember. Ground Zero. Hmm? Ground zero. Ground zero. That is more clear to you, isn't it? Yeah. Just 1.8 kilometers, about one mile. It was pretty close distance. And I was on the second floor of the wooden building. And at the 8 o'clock, we started the morning assembly. And the major and I were giving us a pep talk. And then, to the, well, this is the day you start improving your patriotism to the emperor, do your best. Yes, sir. At that moment, we saw the bluish white, white flash outside the window. And I do remember the sensation of floating up in the air. And that was the end of my consciousness. When I regained my consciousness in the total darkness and quiet, um, I tried to move my body, but I couldn't. So I knew I was faced with death. It, it's strange. I wasn't upset uh, or panic-stricken or anything like that. 
I was serenely accepting the death I thought I was facing. Then all, all of a sudden, I started hearing faint voices of my classmates. Mother, help me. God, help me. I am here. And I know whose voice that was. About 30 girls were surrounding me, and um, we were in the same room on the second floor. But they were all down, trapped. And uh, all of a sudden, the male voice shouted at me, and with a strong push on my left shoulder from behind, don't give up, don't give up, keep pushing, keep moving. Keep kicking, I'm trying to free you. And then he said, you see some sunray coming through that opening. Crawl, crawl toward it as quickly as possible. Go. He practically pushed. I never saw him in the dark, but there was a human being in the darkness who rescued my life. So I came out. And then I found two other girls managed to come out. Three of us looked around. Although that was a morning, by the time we came out, it was dark. Dark like twilight. I think it's because of all the soot and the smoke and the particle up in the air, which was going up in that mushroom cloud and that prevented the sun day. Then we, I started looking at some moving dark objects. And I thought, well, there must be human beings, but they didn't quite look like human beings. It was just chunk of meat, burnt meat, flesh and the skin. The hair was straight, rising straight up, and the skin and the flesh were hanging from their hands and bones, and they covered them with blood, and burned and scorched and blackened, and, and parts of the bodies were missing. Some were carrying their own eyeballs in their hands. But I wasn't shocked or anything. I just saw them. And uh, so she said, well, join those people, join this procession, and escape to the hillside. We did that by carefully stepping <coughs> over the dead bodies and into the people in the ground. Now, at the foot of the hillside we escaped to, there was a huge military training ground, about two football fields combined. By the time we got there, the place was packed with the dead bodies, dying people, and injured people. And the strange memory is, everything was so quiet, quiet like it is now. Nobody was shouting like, give me water, I'm thirsty. Nobody had that kind of physical, psychological strength. They simply said in whisper, give me water, water please. Well, we wanted to be of some help, but there were no buckets or no containers to carry water. So we three girls settled on the hillside and found a stream nearby. And we went there to wash our bodies covered with blood and so on. And then we tore off our blouses and soaked them in the water. And with as much water in it, we rushed back to the dying people who put them over the mouth of those injured people. They desperately sucked the moisture 
picked up, and then they looked at you know, and said, thank you. And then that was the end. But that was a level of rescue, not really rescue, but the relief we could give. Those are the people who are burned by 4,000 degree Celsius heat. You see, when the explosion took place about 600 meters above the ground, I understand that the temperature of, at the center of that explosion was over 1 million Celsius, degrees Celsius. But it quickly descended down to the ground level. By that time, it got cooled down, much, much cooled down, and down to 4. Degrees Celsius. Well, I think the iron melts about a few hundred degrees, right? Any scientists here? No. But anyway, the kind of heat which burned the city and people. And the blast. All right, well, I better change this stuff. I better, I, better, I better not give you the detail. Okay. I just thought I would give you the detail of what was happening to hundreds of 360,000 people then. It was an indiscriminate attack by that new bomb. Children, women, elderly people, they're all attacked. and about 250,000 people. And the rest of my schoolmates were in the, part, in the center part of the city, together with other high school students in grades seven and eight. All the high school students were there. They were doing certain job to clear the fire lane. Several thousand of them, and they are the ones you know, to be at the center, to be right under the explosion. They simply never came back. They simply melted the vaporized. My sister-in-law was a teacher. She was supervising. Uh, she support, well, she is still considered to be missing. We don't know what happened. And that happened to several thousand high school kids. But anyway, I won't give you the detail, but I only say the blast and the heat and the unique thing about nuclear weapon, that is the effect of radiation. That killed many people, and it's still killing today. It's 70 years since then, but people are still dying from the delayed effect of nuclear weapon. It, you can see the, the you can see um, okay. anyway all right well I just wanted to tell you uh, and that's roughly the days and uh, survival afterwards in the aftermath was very difficult because I think uh, yes, Mary mentioned something about uh, people's health condition. But women who were pregnant at that time produced the deformed babies, and they were burned badly, and ended up with having ugly scars. So people outside who fear us, or they don't be near them, you get contaminated by the effect of atomic bomb. So that kind of situation developed that social uh, discrimination. Um, well, I can't say everything, but we give you we give you a little bit of a story. Maybe you're curious about many things. Perhaps you can go to your library and read the books. So that could lead you to the next stage of the um, study. 
But I finished university in Hiroshima. What? Did you have university after that? Well, that's a long story. But, <laughs> but I finished in 1954, and um, that was a special year uh, for human calendar. And maybe you people are not too, too aware. But you see, American tested the large, the biggest hydrogen bomb at the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, and killing people, injuring people, damaging the environment. And the fishermen around, the Japanese fishermen, were injured, and they were covered with white ashes of death and one of them died, and all the catch of the tuna fish, Japanese depend on the fish, right? That's the main food. And that had to be thrown away. And for the first time, the housewives of all parts of Japan realized what the nuclear weapon testing was all about. They heard a little bit about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but during the wartime, I mean, du during the occupation period after Japan's surrender, where occupation forces tried to cover up the effects of the bombing, uh, the human suffering had to be suppressed. Well, to say the United States is great, we produced such a fantastic, uh, phenomenal uh, technological scientific achievement. That was all right for the world to find out. But to say what kind of um, humanitarian harm the bomb creates, that was a no-no. So they started the census censorship with a paper, and they even confiscated people's diaries, and poems, pictures, uh, photographs, uh, even medical charts, all these, you know, uh, about 31,000 items, you know, was discovered. Anyway, I just will give you a bit of a social condition. Anyway, at that time, I got a scholarship to come to the United States. And uh, as soon as I came, a uh, journalist asked me, well, Japan is in uproar. What do you think about that? So naive, fresh graduate, college graduate, and I told them honestly how I felt. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Bikini, how long is the United States going to continue with the so-called nuclear weapon development and killing and damaging the environment in the meantime? It's about time to stop and reassess and stop the whole thing. Yeah, that kind of thing, fresh college graduate, probably said, I guess. And the next day, I started getting the hate mail, threat, threatening mail, hate mail. This is. Within a couple of days after I arrived in university near Washington, D.C., and I couldn't go to the classroom, the professor gave me his place, the president uh, started then receiving all these hate letters from me. So I had a week or so to be by myself. How am I going to live in this country? I just arrived, I cannot go back to Japan. It's frightening. Uh, how am I going to live? Am I going to pretend that I never experienced anything like that and shut my mouth? Well, it was painful, but I came out of that week, I think, uh, with a stronger commitment to the original vow, which is, it is my responsibility as a survivor to keep talking about it to the world as a warning to people. Because it's not just what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was a universal problem. It was global community. And unless all of us learn about it and waking up to the reality of living in the nuclear age and start seeking the information, the truth about 
what nuclear age means. We may not have this world to live in. So it was my uh, vow that I would keep talking about it. But I have been doing it uh, ever since my I became adult. Uh, but I think my encounter in the United States within the first day of my arrival, it was a traumatizing experience. But somehow, I responded to it, and I will come. So ever since, I have been working with people like Catherine, and there I have made many colleagues, partners in many parts of the world. I go around the world and give my message. No more nuclear weapon. No. You know, lots of political leaders and military people have all kinds of uh, justification for building up more nuclear arms in order to protect you know, national security, international security, you know. And spending billions of dollars, and I think it was 2013, it was 1.7 trillion dollars all of the world spent on arms. And that's crazy. That kind of money should be coming here. Hospital, schools, and helping the weak. Priority on life. It's all crooked. It's a very insane world when you really look at it. I want you to take time to do some critical thinking about life. We don't deserve to see that kind of miserable collective death without human dignity. That's what we saw, and we never want to see again. No human being should. So I want you to ask yourself now, what can I do? How should I prepare myself to deal with this issue? I guess that would be my message. You're the time, right? Thank okay. you so much, Setsuko.